person that I would consider to never have had a weight problem until recent years. I just never had a weight problem, always been small, I mean really small, size one and two small. And I got married and started having children and my mom would tell me, well when you get to be about 30, you're gonna put on weight. And so when I reached 30, I laughed. I said, well, I didn't. When I was 32, I didn't. And when I got to be about somewhere between 33 and 34, I started putting on weight, but I was happy because I had been so small that I felt that I looked too young. I thought I looked like a girl. I thought, well, now I'm starting to look like a woman because I have some weight. So I was, I was actually happy about it. And the weight kept you know, creeping on a little bit here and then a little bit there. And it wasn't so bad. I, it was still no big deal to me, you know, because I, now, I, now I feel like I had a shape at least. Well, um, I have four children, including a set of twins. And when I, when I gave birth to my twins, I had, um, I gained about 40 pounds, which is not bad for being pregnant with twins. But I thought, well, I don't ever want to be big like this again. I didn't like it. I couldn't tie my shoes. It was just, it was too big for me. Well, as I continued to gain weight, I was about three pounds short of being my twin pregnancy weight. And I thought, okay, I'm about to be pregnant with twins and I'm not pregnant, you know, this, this is it. Well, my mom had been on the program and you know, I've seen my mom on a lot of programs and she would lose weight and she would gain it back and she would lose weight and gain it back. So I've seen some of everything and I'm not a person that had really tried anything. Weight just wasn't a problem. Well, I was overweight, what I call overweight for, um, I don't know, four or five years. And, and most people would not have said that I was overweight, you know, because it was still smaller than a lot of people, but it was, it was overweight. And I decided that I would try this, you know, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to lose weight. I love this program. I have a, a Bible verse that I got from the program that I love that's, um, I think it's from Psalms 24. I sought the Lord and he heard my cry and he took away all my fears. And I love that and I think about it. I have it on a little card in my purse. And it's just something that I like to look at, you know, when I have other things going on that, um, that bother me, you know. And one thing I like about the program, it, it causes you to look at why you were eating, you know. What, why, why, why are you eating? You know, it's not time to eat. I shouldn't be hungry. You know, what is going on that I feel that I need to eat right now? So I kind of switched from eating because I was upset or nervous to, you know, maybe dealing with the situation head on. You know, I, I, I kind of took that turn. So um, there might have been times where, I don't know, my family probably thought, wow, we're, what's wrong with her? Or where's this all coming from? But it was me trying to stop the eating when it was a problem and, and deal with the situation. And um, I'm a person that liked, I realized the, the program also lets you know kind of what your problem is in eating. You know, what is it that you eat or what is it that you, you overdo? I, I found that out. I, I didn't realize I was a person that um, overused mayonnaise and butter and dressing and gravy. Those I knew I liked those, but I just had never really thought about it. And I'm, I was the kind of person that I liked butter so much that I would get my food, put the butter on, then cover the butter with just a, enough food just to cover the butter, then put more on top so nobody could see how much I actually had. It's just really taught me a lot about myself. In going over the program, the, the daily readings and the, the Bible verse, that was, was like a, a special devotional for me. I mean, really special, you know, to, to read those, those um, the readings that you wrote and, and the scriptures that went along with them. And it's like, wow, this, this stuff is in the Bible. And it's, you know, just a lot of different verses that talked about um, control and um, just a lot of areas. And I, that, was, that was just great. It was like my own, my own personal devotional, even though that's not what it, I guess that's not what it really was, but that's the way that I used it, you know. It was my time to read that and to, you know, to read my Bible and to reflect, and I, and I enjoyed that. It, it's given me confidence to feel like I, I can, there's a lot more things that I can do and that I, I could be doing. Um, I'm in school right now. I was already in school, but it, it's helped me in, in my classes, you know, and 
and I use that verse. I, I kind of struggle with math and I use that verse with my math class. Even though I'm still struggling, I, I, I feel different about it. I think I'm not quite as afraid of it as I was. You know, I sought the Lord and He heard my cry and He took away all my fears. So I, I have that to, um, to rely on, to go back to. Today you begin the final week of the first phase of your weight loss journey. Do you realize how far you've come in just five short weeks? You hold in your heart a new freedom born of knowledge and hope. It's exciting to look in the mirror and see a thinner reflection. It's encouraging to step into your clothes and feel how loose they've become. You have just begun to reap the rewards of all your hard work. The physical, emotional, and spiritual disciplines that you have committed to following are beginning to pay off. Give yourselves a hand. I mean it, you deserve the applause. The Living Bible states in the book of Proverbs, the good man eats to live, while the evil man lives to eat. By now, you probably understand this proverb better than most people. Before prism, you were bound by desires to eat unhealthy food which led to overweight, health problems, and low self-esteem. But now you have been set free to lead a full, healthy, happy life where food doesn't give meaning to life but simply serves a purpose in life. This process of discovery is ongoing and must continue one day at a time. At the end of this week's meeting, we will preview what's in store during the second phase of the PRISM program. Keep your mind's eye focused on the finish line. You've come a long way and there are more victories to come. But for now, let's continue that journey one step at a time. This week we are privileged to once again have Udo Erasmus with us to continue his teaching on the subject of fat. Udo Erasmus has become an internationally recognized authority on the subject of fats and oils. He frequently provides consulting services to health professionals, industry, and individuals from his base in Vancouver, Canada. His academic credentials include two years of postgraduate studies in genetics and biochemistry and a PhD in nutrition. He pioneered technology for pressing and packaging healthful oils and markets his own line of high-quality products. Last week we learned about the benefits from healthy fat, as detailed in Udo's book, Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill. But just as the title of his informative book implies, there is a part two to his discussion on this topic. But first let's hear more of the good news as Udo concludes his lesson on the fats that heal. So the question is, where do you get the omega-3s and omega-6s? The richest source is flax. It's a grain that used to be used to make linseed oil for painting furniture. Well, the oil, when it's fresh, is called flax oil. So flax seed or flax oil, if the oil is made with health in mind. Very good source of omega-3s, but a very poor source of omega-6s. So the ratio is, is not right. And if a person uses flax oil exclusively, they will become omega-6 deficient, and then everything falls apart, okay? Uh, High-fat cold water fish have derivatives of both omega-3 and 6. Uh, those include salmon, mackerel, albacore tuna, trout, herring, sardines. Um, you get a little bit in dark green vegetables, but they only have about 0.1% fat in them. So in order to get your daily supply to make your skin soft and velvety, you'd have to eat about 50 pounds, and the cow only eats 25. So this is not, but they are a source, okay? For the omega-6s, most seeds and nuts have omega-6s in them. My favorite source is sunflower and sesame seeds, or their oils made with health in mind, because those seeds also have good minor ingredients. The minor ingredients uh, from those three, we also use minor ingredients from oat germ and rice germ oil. We use organic evening primrose oil. The flax, sunflower, and sesame are also organic. Uh, that way you don't have to overheat them to try and get rid of the pesticides.
you grow them right, then you don't, you know, if you don't make a mess at the front end, you don't have a mess to clean up at the back end. Um, and then we also use medium chain triglycerides. They have some very good features. They're the good stuff from tropical fat. They remove all the stuff that's bad. And then there's vitamin E and uh, tocotrienols and ro uh, rosemary oil. Those are good antioxidants, both for the oil and for the body, and they keep the oils fresh. Um, I don't use safflower and corn oil, which are rich sources of omega-6, because they have some nasty minor ingredients. Um, and the rest of the sources of omega-6s are lower. Almond has a little, peanut has a little, but they have a lot of non-essential fatty acids in them. Olive has very good minor ingredients that improve liver, gallbladder, digestive, and cardiovascular function, but it is one of the poorest sources of essential fats, only 10% omega-6 and virtually no omega-3s. So often what I'll do is for Mediterranean dishes, I will mix extra virgin olive oil, which is made right with the blend that we use. So that, that way you get the minor ingredients and the Mediterranean taste and the essential fats that are missing from extra virgin olive oil and you end up with a lighter oil because olive oil is a f quite a heavy oil. So those are, <clears throat> those are the sources, the main sources. How do you use oil? Well, oils are very easy to use because they actually go with everything. Uh, you can put them in salad dressings. You can put them on steamed vegetables. You can put them in soup. You can mix them in yogurt. A lot of athletes put the oil blend in their protein shake. Uh, you can put it on fruit juice, which sounds strange, but actually tastes quite good because if you don't like the taste of oil, then the fruit juice cuts that taste very nicely. And what you do is you just put it in, in fruit juice and you, you mix it up or you swish it around in your mouth and you'll notice the oil taste disappears. The fruit flavor is enhanced and the juice has a little more body to it. The form that the oils come in, brown glass bottle in a box to protect them from light, they should be refrigerated. At this point, you find them in the health food stores. They're also available in capsules, but the capsules really are not appropriate for most adults. We made the capsules for infants who only need a little bit of oil, and we measure the amount. The best way to measure it is by how the skin feels. If your skin is dry, you need more oil. But you can ballpark how much that is by one teaspoon per 15 pounds of body weight. Okay, that's a ballpark. Now that gets somebody who weighs 300 pounds up to um, 20 teaspoons. 20 teaspoons is about seven tablespoons, a little more than seven tablespoons. So a lot of oil for really big people. That's what some of our big bodybuilders take too. <clears throat> um, the, the, problem, the capsules are for infants because they only need a small amount of oil. For travelers who don't want to spill oil on their underwear in their suitcase, and for people who are so fat phobic that they won't use oil, but they'd be willing to swallow a capsule. It'll give you some, but you're not going to get optimums. The reason why is because it takes 14 capsules to make one tablespoon. So if you're a two or three tablespoon person, then you, uh, you'd be taking a lot of capsules. They become very expensive. You get a lot of gelatin. And as a joke, I tell people they should only take the capsules if they have a gelatin deficiency. Of course, there is no such thing. We are so privileged to present to you the fascinating lecture Udo gave specifically for PRISM on the fats that kill. Please listen closely to Udo's teaching as he exposes the manufacturing processes that turn healing fats into fats that can actually damage human health. So the story of the fats that heal and the fats that kill is not complete without uh, saying something about the fats that kill. They're not nearly as interesting and not nearly as important as the fats that heal, but because they cause problems, it's worth looking at them and pointing our fingers at them. So the first, uh, first thing to know is that most of the health problems we blame on fats should be blamed on destructive processing that is applied to fats that may have been good to begin with in order to give them a long shelf life. Good fats don't have a good shelf life unless you freeze them solid. If you freeze them solid, they shrink so you won't break the glass bottle, unlike water. Um, 
And then they have a three-year shelf life, and you can ignore the six-month shelf date under refrigeration that's on the box. Um, but the industry took a different route. One of the ways that they made oils have a long shelf life is by hydrogenating or partially hydrogenating them and turning them into margarine shortenings, vegetable shortenings, uh, shortening oils and partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. <clears throat> and in that process, the essential fats are destroyed, the omega-3 preferably because it's the most active, and then the omega-6. And trans fatty acids are produced. Trans fatty acids are twisted molecules. They have never been present in nature in the past three and a half billion years in the form in which we find them in these hydrogenated products. And there are many problems associated with them. In 1994, Harvard School of Public Health publicized a very large study that came to the conclusion that trans fatty acids double the risk of heart attack, increase total cholesterol, increase LDL cholesterol, and decrease HDL cholesterol. And What's interesting about that is that it wasn't the first time that, it wasn't the first study to show that. It was just the first one that got a lot of publicity. And there used to be an ad on television with a guy doing push-ups, looking at you through the screen and saying, my doctor made me think twice about health, like doing exercise, eating a varied diet, and using a certain brand of margarine because the margarines were always marketed with the implication that they were good for cardiovascular health. And the day that Harvard publicized this study in 1994, that ad disappeared. Because now, anyone who had a heart attack and had eaten margarine was in a position to sue the margarine manufacturer for their heart attack. Because the research always pointed in the opposite direction. But the advertising misrepresented you know, of course, for sales. There's a difference between advertising and research. Well, in 1994, uh, there were already a number of other problems associated with trans fatty acids from studies, that they change the way the immune system works. And I don't know if you want to mess with an immune system. It took a long time to put it together the way it works. It's a good system. That they decrease testosterone, increase abnormal sperm, and interfere with pregnancy in animals. And no human reproductive studies have ever been done that I'm aware of, although a lot of trans fatty acids were fed to a lot of people. Uh, there is research that shows that they correlate with low birth weight human babies. They decrease the quality of human breast milk. They interfere with insulin function. They interfere with liver detoxification. They raise the strongest known risk factor for cardiovascular disease, which is called lipoprotein little a. They um, change the way fat cells work. They interfere with the good fats. So if you're not getting enough of the good fats, they'll make it even worse. Uh, and since 1994, there's also been shown a correlation between trans fatty acids and breast cancer and also that they decrease cerebral cortex function, which means they, make, they lower your intelligence. They make you stupid. So eating margarine will make you stupid. Remember that. Okay. Um, so they really ought not to be in the diet of anybody who's interested in health. They work in the body like saturated fats, they, uh, but they cause other problems as well. Saturated fats basically slow you down, okay? So there, I call those killer fat one. Killer fat two, anything that's fried, fried fat, fat or oil, whatever you use. If you turn, if you put fat in the frying pan, you overheat it, and when you overheat it, you change the chemistry from natural to unnatural and toxic. And frying is associated with increased cancer and increased cardiovascular disease. That's been known in research for at least 40 years. Also uh, makes irritable bowel problems worse, especially omega-6 oils that are fried. Uh, those are really the, the main uh, problems 
that we know are caused by fried fats. So the question then becomes, well, what can I fry with? Because a lot of people say, well, I got to fry. You don't got to fry, but a lot of people want to fry. Uh, you get the least toxicity if you use a little bit of butter, but you're still going to get toxicity. When you turn food brown, it's because you've overheated it. And the brown on food is also toxic. So whether you brown your vegetables or you toast your bread or you roast your, your beef or you put it on a barbecue or you fry or, or deep fry or saute, whatever you turn brown on the food is toxic. Makes sense. You're starting with something natural. First it gets yellow. First it gets cooked. Then it gets yellow. Then it goes brown. Then it goes black. And then it turns into smoke, right? Most of us have done that anywhere along the line, right? And smoke, we know, causes cancer. Uh, f f cooks who spend a lot of time in front of their frying pan have more lung cancer just from breathing in the smoke. Probably in the home, the same thing happens, only you don't spend as much time in the f front of the frying pan, so it probably takes longer. Um, the breast cancer protective properties of extra virgin olive oil are completely lost when it's fried. That's what the research shows. And the traditional use of extra virgin olive oil was that the Italians would steam their food and then add the extra virgin oil after the food was done. And that way the oil didn't get overheated. And that's what we suggest people do. You, when people say, what should I fry with? Fry your foods in water. So you steam, poach, boil, or pressure cook them. Then you put them on the plate and then you add the good oils. That way you haven't burned the food and made it toxic, you haven't made, made the, burnt the oil and made it toxic, you get the flavor enhancement that oils bring to food, you get better absorption of the oil-soluble phytonutrients that are present in foods that are poorly absorbed when oil isn't present, you get the essential fats in their natural state, and you don't have to go to the time and expense, expense to cut off and <coughs> throw away the burnt part of the food. The only change you have to make is you have to learn to prefer unburnt foods. That's an acquired taste. You know that it's an acquired taste. If you ever see a squirrel with a frying pan, then you know it's a natural process. It's not a natural process. Um, it's not a big change to make because your barbecue, the outside dries out and then overheats and then burns. The inside is steamed anyway, so most of our food is steamed anyway. Your fried vegetables, the outside dries out, overheats, and burns, the inside is steamed. Your bread, the outside dries out, overheats, turns brown, and, and gets burnt, the inside is steamed. So most of the food we eat is steamed anyway. So when people say,